Uh, so, uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective for, for real. Ooh, yay. Great to see everybody here. Um, wonderful. So, uh, let's get started. So, the theme for tonight's class, the theme for tonight's Dharma Doors is Abhaya, which is a Sanskrit word that means fearlessness. So tonight, we're going to talk all about this aspect of Buddhism, this, this quality of a, of a Buddha, quality of a Bodhisattva, which is this idea of being fearless. So I, I want everybody to remember that's the theme for tonight. We're just going to focus on that idea. But because this is the Dharma doors, we have been working on a sutra. And we will return to the sutra because that's sort of what's going on in the sutra tonight is they're talking about fearlessness. So this is a sutra I've been doing now for well, weeks now. I, I forget how long. I, I don't even know what number we are on anymore. But the idea is, is that this is one of those Mahayana Buddhist sutras that is about the bodhisattva path to enlightenment and the i'm not going to go through all of the all of the places we've been in the sutra up until now i'm not going to go through all of that because i do want to focus on the the theme but the way that this sutra has been going is basically the buddha has been telling Shariputra, uh, a monk, about the Bodhisattva path and describing all of these qualities of a Bodhisattva. And the way that he's been doing it is he's sort of, at least at the point where we're at in the sutra now, is he has said, well, if a Bodhisattva only has one quality, They'll, you know, fulfill their vow, they'll purify their Buddha land and all of that. And then there was a part where it said, and if a Bodhisattva only has these two qualities, they will fulfill their vow and purify their Buddha land and so on and so on. Last week, we learned about three qualities a Bodhisattva could have or does have that would purify their Buddha land and fulfill their aspiration. And those three qualities that we talked about last week were, one was about enjoying solitude. Forest dwelling was the actual theme last week. And so one quality of a bodhisattva is enjoying time alone in the woods. Or as we talked about it last week, just the idea of being alone and being comfortable and joyful alone. So that's a quality of the bodhisattva. The second quality of the bodhisattva was giving the dharma without expecting any reward. And we talked a little bit about how that could be understood as giving the dharma or flip it, the dharma of giving. And either way, the quality of a bodhisattva was not expecting anything in return for their giving. And then the third was sort of about sticking to your, or the bodhisattva sticks to their vow of discipline, precepts or the rules or the morality. This is about shila, shila, the idea of moral discipline. So that's another aspect of being a bodhisattva. Moral discipline, of course, generosity. And then this idea of living, uh, being alone, being comfortable alone. That's about as far as we got last week, but there was a little bit more to these three qualities. <laughs> so just like when the Buddha said there's this one quality a bodhisattva could have, he went on to say, and there's 10 dharmas, there's 10 things that a bodhisattva will kind of develop based upon that one quality. 
which again was actually the quality of being imperturbable in a sense, akshobhya, that was the theme that night. But then when the Buddha said that there were the two qualities of a bodhisattva, he then listed another additional 10 dharmas that the bodhisattva would sort of develop. Now, when the bodhisattva develops these three qualities that we talked about last week, he is going to go further to say, and for each of those qualities, there's 10 dharmas or 10 things the bodhisattva develops. So tonight we are possibly going to talk about 30 new dharmas. <laughs> so it wouldn't be the dharma doors if we weren't going to talk about a lot of dharma. But it, again, there's a theme tonight. And actually all of these can be understood under the umbrella idea of a bodhisattva developing fearlessness, all right? So it's not going to be too wild in terms of all 30 of these dharmas, because I'm going to mm, interpret them in a way that fits in with this theme tonight. So before we do that, though, I want to say a word about abhaya, this Sanskrit word that means fearlessness. So this is definitely not just one of those Mahayana Bodhisattva ideas. Fearlessness is very much a part of Buddhism, has always been a part of Buddhism. It's, yes, fearlessness is a quality of a Buddha, but just that state of being fearless, Abhaya, is this sort of you know, I never like to put anything, I never like to put anything up there as a goal, like that this is the goal in that sense. But the idea is, is that th this is where this is headed. Let's put it that way, right? This is the path leads to fearlessness. So before we get into um, the ideas of the sutra, before we get into all of that, I did want to just say a few things about the idea of fearlessness. I know that for me, when I first sort of started hearing about that and this particular type of fearlessness that a, a Buddha has, it's often likened to the lion-like nature of the Buddha. This, the, the, a, a lion, you know, uh, the human lion, they call a Buddha, this sort of, um, fearless person in that way, like a lion. And they also talk about fearlessness in terms of making the lions roar and things like that. So when I first learned about fearlessness, I had one idea in mind of like what that meant and what that was. And I've definitely come to some very different ideas of what fearlessness means in Buddhism. I guess what I mean is I've come to a deeper understanding of what abhaya means in Buddhism. And one of the things I want to share with you, this will be interesting as we move back into the sutra, but I do want to share with you a different uh, sutra really quickly. So if you're familiar, of course, with the Nikayas, right, the early teachings of the Buddha, this is the Majima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. And the fourth sutra in here is called, I don't know if you'll be able to see that, but it's called the Bahya Behrava Sutta on fear and dread. And there's that word just Bahya, not Abhaya, fearlessness, but Bahya, fear, and then Berava, dread. So as many of you know, I have a little, my little Lotus Underground podcast sound project thing going on where I recite sutras and sometimes I kind of go through sutras or I do different things on my podcast thing. But I've recently recited this sutra for uh, my podcast because I really like this sutra. I think it's really important. And if you go through here, a few things pop out at you regarding fear or 
fearlessness. The first thing that I want to mention, and it has to do with tonight, that sutta, so it's a Pali sutta, right? One of the old suttas. The Buddha basically talks about going into the woods alone. Interesting. Interesting connection with our the, the main sutra we're reading, right? So the Buddha talks about how when he goes into the woods and he can go on the most auspicious, spookiest night of the month to the most spookiest, scariest cremation ground. And he says he's not afraid. And this idea is what he says is, is that there's these other Brahmins and ascetics that go into the woods alone, go to the cremation grounds at night alone, and they get afraid. And he basically starts to equate shila, moral discipline, and the cultivation of fearlessness. Because what he says in that sutra is, is that these Brahmins and these ascetics, they go running into the woods all alone, but they haven't cultivated truthfulness, for example, or abstaining from killing or stealing or taking sexuality or taking intoxicants, right? The five precepts. The Buddha says, I don't, I don't go into the woods having broken the precepts. And so when I go in the woods, I don't, I don't have fear. So it's an interesting sutra for correlating moral discipline and fearlessness. So interesting there. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention was that connection with moral discipline. But then the, the second and more important thing that I want to mention is that tonight, what I've come to understand for myself is that this state of fearlessness, it's not as stoic as I first thought. I thought this was some real, you know, I don't even know in many ways what I thought, but it was just something very, I mean, maybe it was sort of, I don't even know, you know, I want to say like, maybe it was too Hollywood informed or too masculine or whatever it was. I had a certain notion of fearlessness that I've since come to realize it's not as stoic and inachievable because really what we're talking about, and I just will get to it. What I'm talking about is, is sort of, well, what is the opposite of fearlessness? Yes, we would say it's fear, but what I mean is, is that tonight I really wanna be focusing, focusing on Bhaya, so fear, as more about being nervous. <laughs> yes, anxious, yes, you know, a lot of other qualities that go with all of that, but it's kind of really about uncertainty, nervousness, doubt, and then there's the opposite of that, a kind of certainty, a kind of not being nervous, a kind of not being all of those things. So let's move into the sutra with that in mind, not fearlessness as this, you know, charging head on to confront the enemy kind of an idea, but actually much more of a, a sense of um, emotional stability, let's call it. But let's go deeper because I have, I think, some interesting things to say. So in, there's some interesting things going on, as always, with these sutras. So after the Buddha tells us about these three qualities of a bodhisattva, right? Enjoying being alone, giving the Dharma without <laughs> expecting anything in reward, right? And moral discipline. He begins by saying, Shariputra. And it, what's interesting is that he starts with the last. So he starts with this idea of bodhisattvas who abide by their vows of discipline. So that was one of the, the qualities of a bodhisattva is that they abide by their vow of discipline. 
And bodhisattvas who abide by their vows of discipline attain 10 kinds of fearlessness. What are these 10, you may ask? They are fearlessly entering cities, fearlessly teaching the Dharma to an assembly, fearlessly eating food, fearlessly leaving the city, fearlessly entering a monastery, fearlessly entering the Sangha or the community, fearlessly imparting instruction, fearlessly going before their teacher or preceptor, fearlessly instructing the assembly with a loving attitude, and fearlessly utilizing clothing, food, bedding, medicine, and other supplies. A bodhisattva who abides by their vows of discipline attains these 10 types of fearlessnesses and the words they speak will be remembered. <laughs> okay, so let's just, we'll do these one at a time. So, so those are the 10 fearlessnesses, 10 types of fearlessness that a bodhisattva develops by abiding by their vow of discipline. So again, you know, we're kind of generally talking about, well, generally we're talking about shila, moral discipline, but specifically if we're talking about abiding by vows of discipline, of course, within the world of Buddhism, that is always usually referring to at the very least the five precepts, right? There's more, there's eight precepts and 10 precepts and 250 precepts for monastics. But at the base bare minimum, we're probably talking at least about the five main precepts, not taking life, not taking what is not given, right? not taking sexuality is how I think of that one, not taking sexuality, but if it's offered, not taking intoxicants and truth speaking, speaking honestly. So those are the five and that's kind of a different order than you've probably heard them, but that's the five main precepts. And it's abiding by those, abiding by the vow to stick to those, that brings about these 10 kinds of fearlessness. So when you read those, they clearly sound very uh, monastic. They're kind of seemingly referring to going into a city, begging for food, eating the food, leaving, going back to the monastery, and then doing something at the monastery. But in reading these, and for, for our purposes here tonight, I, I wanted to do a little bit of interpreting. And it's actually, you know, I was, it was at the end of last class, class last Sunday, and I was looking ahead for tonight. And, you know, I was thinking, well, how could I approach teaching these things? And one of them stuck out right away right? Fearlessly eating food. And it was right then that I was like, oh, that, that's what I want to talk about. <laughs> Not fearlessly eating, taking food per se, but it was that one in particular where I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, they're kind of referring to the life of a monastic. And like I said, going and begging and all of that. But there's more to this, of course. And so when, we, when I saw, personally, when I saw this one about fearlessly eating food, that's when I immediately flipped it in my mind. And I was like, well, what would it be to fearfully eat food? And then I was like, oh, that sounds like an eating disorder. That sounds like nervousness around eating food. And, you know, I don't want to get too specific or dwell too long about any, um, you know, 
anxieties or phobias or what have you. But, you know, in my life, I haven't always had the best relationship with food, to be honest. Something, something I've had problems in terms of a kind of maybe a nervousness about in a way. It's gotten better, but it's definitely something that I can appreciate, which is um, not, not fearlessly <laughs> receiving or taking food, <laughs> put it that way. So when I read that one in particular, and it really resonated with me personally, that's when I started thinking about, oh, let's take the first one, fearlessly entering a city. Well, we have this thing called agoraphobia, right? We have this, this state of fear of public places, fear of crowds, fear of that. Mm, I'm not a huge fan fan of crowded places, but I wouldn't say I have that phobia per se. But what I'm getting at tonight is, is that I want to think about these 10, and actually all 30 of these if we get that far, but I want to be thinking about their broader implications or applications that way. And thinking about, well, I guess thinking about the practice in that sense, the practices of bodhisattvas, the practices of Buddhism, and understanding, well, actually, let me go through a few more of these, and then we'll pull back and kind of talk about the practice in that way. So a bodhisattva who abides by their vow of discipline, right, fearlessly enters a city. And so, again, you could think of that as a kind of anxiety about public places in that way. Um, you know, fearlessly teaching an assembly. Last time I checked, that's called fear of public speaking. And many, many people have a fear of public speaking, right? Um, so that actually could be a very interesting one. Um, I mean, for us to look at uh, fearlessly eating food, as I already mentioned. Um, the next one, and actually, I'll just say this because I don't know when else I'll say it. You know, we're we're, I'm usually reading from this English translation that's from the Tibetan version of this. But as I've mentioned, I'm referring to a Chinese version of the same sutra. And the Chinese is a little more clear about the 10 things. And the Tibetan actually only has nine things, if you read it carefully. And so the one that was missing from the Tibetan version is it actually is about fearlessly leaving the city. <laughs> All right. So, um, and again, that could sort of be about, you know, um, let me put it to you this way. I lived in uh, New York for many, many years, a uh, big chunk of my adult life. And I met many a New Yorker, many a Manhattanite that had never left the island of Manhattan. The very idea of going out of the city didn't sit well with a few of these people I met. They literally were afraid to leave the city, to leave the kind of the, co the comfort of the city, this whatever it was that they found there, they didn't want to leave it. So you could kind of put that there as a, what would, what, fear of leaving the city? something like that, perhaps. Um, fearlessly entering a monastery, of course. That's an interesting one. Not to say that a lot of people have fear about entering a monastery, but again, if you wanted to sort of interpret that one or think about it, I would suggest it not being about fear of entering a monastery, but about not wanting to do that. <laughs> and what I mean is, is the idea of celibacy and the idea of an austere life in a monastery may not be appealing to everybody, but and I mean it from a sense of nervousness where you wouldn't want to go do that because you feel like you couldn't make it in that environment or something to that effect. Um, fearlessly go going before uh, teachers, right? I mean, that's sort of also kind of ideas of 
more formal teaching environments, more formal classroom environments, and a te- and a student who would be afraid to, you know, con- like if the teacher said, uh, so and so, I want to see you after class, right? You could imagine a high school student or whatever student being fearful and nervous about confronting their their teacher in that way. Well, the same thing would happen also to um, a monk in terms of their their senior, their preceptor, or their master. So a bodhisattva in that sense would be fearless in going before their teacher. Fearlessly instructing the assembly with a loving attitude. My sense about that one is, is that we were to understand the first um, teaching of the assembly as we go into the city and kind of teach the people. And then we go back to the monastery and then there's instruction for our other monastics in that way. Either way, my feeling about the doing it fearlessly would also be about public speaking and the idea of being the focal point of a crowd in that way. And then of course the Bodhisattva does that with loving kindness. And then the last of these is kind of a general one about how the Bodhisattva fearlessly utilizes clothing, food, bedding, medicine, and other supplies. All right. So there's a lot of ways to understand that one, especially from a a Buddhist point of view. And yeah, I'll just start there and then kind of work backwards. But that last one, the idea of just utilizing, say, for example, bedding. Just take that one, right? But it was clothing, food, bedding, medicine, supplies. But what I'm going to say applies to all of them. If you are, if you were to take the 10 precepts, so not just the five precepts, but the 10 precepts, one of the 10 precepts, which is just five more in addition to the five I've already mentioned, but one of those is not sleeping on a high bed, for example. It's an old one, old part of the Buddhist tradition that are kind of a a good Buddhist in that way, basically sleeps on the floor, sleeps on a mat, and doesn't sleep on a raised bed. As far as I've studied Vinaya and studied Buddhist um, monastic discipline in that sense, that one seems to be about luxury and wealth and things that if you could afford a real bed, that was a little bit luxurious. And so it was better to have that kind of meager, simple lifestyle of sleeping on the ground, basically. So let's say you're a Buddhist. Let's say you've taken the 10 precepts and you're not wearing garlands, right? Or perfumes, you're not touching gold and silver, you're not eating at the wrong time of day, and you're not sleeping on a high bed, right? So you could imagine somebody thinking, oh, the, the Buddha's, the Buddha, he's got, he's got a problem with beds or there's something about beds. Is my bed too high? Is my mat too high? Am I, am I disappointing the Buddha because my bed is a little bit too high? that would be fearfully utilizing a bed where you've kind of, you know, you've decided to be moral in that way and be a good Buddhist. But then this idea of, again, there's a relationship with doubt and uncertainty in fear and and fearfulness in that way. And so along with, of course, the other ones, medicine, clothing, it's like, oh, the Buddha said I should only wear three robes but it's cold and I'm wearing an extra one. Ah, maybe I shouldn't be doing that, right? (laughs) And I want to remind you too, the Chinese version, last week I mentioned this, the Chinese version, it kind of makes it clear by the addition of one word 
that this is about the bodhisattva abiding by the intention of the vows they've taken. There's one extra word in the Chinese, which is about the intention of the moral discipline. And it's a specific word, it's a specific idea that when you read it, as I mentioned last week, the whole bodhisattva path or a big part of the bodhisattva path, it's about what they would call the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. And the idea is, is that the hardcore shravakas, the voice hearers, the followers of the Buddha, they follow the law to the letter. If the Buddha said three robes, it's three robes. If the Buddha said, don't sleep on a high bed, no high bed. So it's very, the letter of the law. The Bodhisattva path is more about what was the Buddha's intention behind this rule? And that's where I, I even basically shifted into Bodhisattva mode when I said, the prohibition against sleeping on a high bed seems to be about luxury. It doesn't seem to be about elevation. <laughs> like it doesn't seem to be literally about being above the ground. It's about this sort of way of life. That would be the spirit of that prohibition. And what I mean by that is, is that then a bodhisattva would see a simple four post flat, you know, thing, you know, like, let's say you go, uh, an example that comes to mind, you go to a campsite and it has one of those raised platforms to put your tent, to put the thing. You can imagine some, you know, somebody who's a real stickler being like, oh, I can't, I can't sleep on the, on the platform. <laughs> and getting like really nervous that they're gonna be breaking a precept if they're sleeping up on top of that. The Bodhisattva would say, no, the spirit of that prohibition is about luxury and I'm out here camping and there's nothing luxurious about this. <laughs> so I hope you see my point there a little bit about that. And I also kind of wanted to point, oh, actually I haven't even gotten to what I wanna say, but everybody feeling okay about what's going on? Cool. All right. So let's go deeper into fearlessness. Uh, so on these 10, there's, it's sort of, I want to choose one and I want to choose a safe one. And I say safe, I mean, because it's like, I already said, when I'm talking about phobias, when I'm talking about kind of, you know, mental illness in that sense. I wanna be really sensitive about how I say this. So I'm gonna choose one that I feel like I can handle in that sense. And please extrapolate, please expand this out to other phobias and anxieties and things like that. But I wanna look at this one. So the one about fearlessly teaching and assembly the Dharma, right? Definitely something I, can speak about, right? Because I do it often in that way. So this will just be a little insight work, little vipassana into the fear of public speaking. So the little insight, the little glimpse underneath that fear of public speaking. One thing that just seems so obvious about the fear of public speaking is, well, let me put it to you this way. You know how, you know how the Buddha is always talking about the delusion of self? You know how this idea of no self is kind of really important to the Dharma in that way, right? What I want you to kind of start thinking about is how 
public speaking, and in particular, the fear or anxiety about public speaking is so related to a sense of self. You get this real heavy dose of oneself when you're at the podium or at the front, right? And it all becomes about, oh, what are they thinking about me? So now it's like, there's that self just glaring at us in the face, this idea we have of ourselves. And this situation, meaning this public, situ public speaking situation, it puts that self at great risk, <laughs> fully exposed. And there's just so much about that. And what I mean by that is, is that the relationship between that anxiety, that nervousness of public speaking, and a sense of self. Because what I want you to start to notice is, is that if one really wasn't attached to that sense of self, you could imagine how that anxiety subsides. And I just want you to sort of notice that relationship between the two. And by the way, you know, I'm not claiming selflessness. I'm just, I know I have identified what's going on with public speaking and have learned to put it over there in that way. So I'm not claiming, you know, no self in that sense. But having done this a lot, meaning public speaking in that sense, I've just had a lot of opportunities to notice where the anxiety is coming from. And again, it's coming from this idea of like, well, what are they going to think of me? And then there's that me. And it's always that me that I'm either defending or trying to please or all of these different things. So I just want you to kind of start to notice how just that one, meaning that defending a sense of self, how that could lead to a lot of these anxieties and fears and things like that. Now, the good thing, of course, <laughs> is that the Buddha's wisdom is that there is no self, right? That's the, the wisdom here. And so there's a, there's a gateway or a pathway there to the fearlessness by understanding that idea of no self. And what I mean by, let me kind of try to put that together as a I don't know, that's something. <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm getting at is, is <laughs> so in a, in a public speaking situation where you're up there and you're, you're nervous, right? It, you're getting this heavy dose of, oh my gosh, what are they thinking of me? And that me is the very self that the Buddha is talking about, that isn't really existent in that sense. We, we can imagine it in that sense, like that it is an experience. But what I'm getting at is, though, is that the audience, <laughs> they don't know what self this is that you are trying they don't know about only you know about that sense of self you're trying to defend or not and so my point is is that whatever ideas the audience people are having about quote you <laughs> they're going to be having whatever thoughts they're going to be having now, if you're worried about that or concerned about that, well, then just recognize that that's your problem. <laughs> and I hope that doesn't sound callous. I'm just pointing at the actual source of the problem, which is that you have this sense of self. They don't know about that sense of self. And you're going to try to defend this. And I, by defend it, I mean present it well. Right. And then when it's like, oh, no, they're not laughing. I haven't presented myself well enough. 
it's just this big ball of suffering that is arising from that sense of self. And so there's either various techniques you can do to sort of alleviate that sense of self in the moment. Those are like little tricks you can do to uh, perform better. But, or you could actually do the Buddhist practice, do the insight work and come to that realization about how there just isn't that self in that way. And then thereby doing the practice and being a bodhisattva in that way, one can then develop the quality of fearlessly teaching an assembly. We could do this for all of them in that way which is sort of, you know, why would there be fear of going into the city? Why would there be fear of leaving the city? And my point is, and I don't want to do it because I, there, there's a lot more interesting things to talk about, but I just want to share that idea with you of like the Vipassana, the insight work is actually about digging deep into where fear comes from. And that's actually the work. <laughs> is the, the digging and the investigation. There's not actually a lot more to do beyond that in that way. So everybody feeling okay about the first 10? Yeah, no. Um, I just love this teaching tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. It's really, really cool. And I have a question. That's something I want to think about more, but you probably have something to say about it, which is, you kind of drew a connection between sila and the 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 fearlessness like the more you are feeling like you're actually whether it's you know following the precepts or just living you know reasonably and righteously you haven't lied recently you haven't you know then you you that lessens your social anxiety right but and then you drew the the kind of connection between the um, the fearlessness and the sense of self. So that suggests to me there's a, a connection between sila and the sense of self. And that's sort of something I haven't really thought about and I want to think about. But I wondered if you had any anything to say about it. Well, absolutely no. In fact, uh, gr tremendous insight. Great insight, um, putting those pieces together. Um, meaning maybe there's something about moral discipline, Sheila, and that self. Well, as far as I can tell, absolutely. Let's take, I mean, you could take any, any one of them that you like, right? But let's take uh, atadana, right? Taking what has not been given, right? I mean, it just reeks of self in so many different ways as far as give me. In fact, give me it, give me it so hard, I'm going to just take it from you. That's, that's how much it needs to come in this direction towards the self. Taking sexuality also. And by the way, Noam, you could do my thought experiment with these which is like self like what i'm getting at is taking something like sexuality if you were really really fully devoid of that to the point where you already felt fully embraced shall we say by everyone always would you need to take sexuality in that set, and again, remember, for me, taking sexuality is like taking it in that way, not having it, having it. <laughs> so, and then of course, all the other ones too, there's a self that needs to be operating from that place of either violence, deception is a classic one too, where all forms of deception you're trying to protect self this goes all the way back to thinking of a, a like a a, a a young person a child 
Why do they lie to their parents to avoid being punished, to avoid the coming down on the self? So all of five of these in that way, and then even taking intoxicants, as soon as I think of it, it's like, oh, there's, you know, there's a lot going on there in terms of self-medicating. I mean, it's right there in the word self-medicating, but my point is, is that there's a lot of, there's a lot that morally is resolved through the teaching of no self. And, uh, you know, everybody here, at least everybody I can see, everybody's name and everybody, you all know, you know, the idea of this Mahayana Bodhisattva path is that it's the path of wisdom versus the Shravaka path that we're always talking about kind of in a negative sense, where it's about restraint, self-control, and this like a really kind of rigorous practice. And the idea is, is that if you do the rigorous, hardcore, ascetic type practice, you will not take what hasn't been given. You will not take sexuality. You, it, 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 will have been, it'll, it will have been worked out of you if you do the discipline route. The wisdom route, though, leads to the same place. But the idea is, is that rather than, you know, I always say, this is an example I give a lot. One way that you could do it, the Shravaka way to do it is, you know what? I don't want to commit false speech anymore. I want to avoid lying. I want to avoid false speech. So every time I tell a lie, I'm going to have a jar and I'm going to put a dollar in the jar. And then I'm going to, you know, once the jar is full, I'm going to take all of my lie money and I'm going to give it to charity. And therefore I will have converted my bad action of lying into the good action of generosity. That would be a very Shravaka approach to the problem. Discipline, a practice, a, rep, a repetitive thing. I put the dollar in. Oh, I lied again. Put the dollar in. And eventually, maybe, I guess, I'll stop lying because I'm I ran out of money or what, you know, whatever it is. But the idea is you could do it that way. Or we could do it this way. The Bodhisattva sort of looks at deception and lying a slightly different way. We read a great, we read a great sutra many, many, many months ago, a um, long time ago even. And in that sutra, I forget the name of which one it was, the Buddha said something very simple. It's, it's actually a very famous saying, but it comes from the Buddha as far as I can tell. He said, a liar only lies to themselves. And it's, there's a more to that in the sutra, but that's what it boils down to is that idea. And the thing about it is, is this. Lying's an interesting one. Like I said, lying, there's a lot about self going on there and defending the sense of self, you know, and it's kind of like one of those things where I, I used to talk about this one a long time ago. I don't, I don't talk about it anymore because it doesn't happen anymore, but for other reasons. But I used to mention that I used to have this habit problem <laughs> where if I, let's say I got fast food or something to eat, <laughs> if somebody were to ask me, oh, what'd you have for lunch? I would probably say something like, oh, salad. Again, I don't do it anymore for a few reasons. One, because I don't eat fast food anymore. Yeah. But also that habit of, I've, I've worked on it a little bit and I try not to do that anymore. But what I realized, the insight, the Vipassana that I had about that was what's going on there? 
Why would I tell somebody I had a salad when really I had Taco Bell? Oh, I want them to think I'm this type of person. And I think if I tell them I had Taco Bell, they'll think I'm that type of person, which is the kind of person I am because I had Taco Bell, by the way. But I don't want them to know who I really am in that sense, because I've got this whole uh, image going on that I'm trying to protect. And so I will tell this, you know, it's just a white, the whitest of little lies. Who really cares, right? It doesn't, it doesn't harm the other person if I tell them I had a salad when I really, I had Taco Bell, right? That's where the Bodhisattva realizes that this isn't about the other person. It's entirely about this delusion. The Buddha calls it a delusion in that sense. And it's entirely about a delusion that we're having where, again, Michael, the real Michael, had Taco Bell. But I don't want to, for some reason, I don't want to own and be that person, even though, again, I am. And so I'm going to start creating this facade of the salad eating Michael. And this isn't real, but it's what I'm saying. So how crazy do I look right now, right? Where I'm like, I'm saying this, but I'm really this and da, 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 da. And I want to repeat something I said earlier. It was about my public speaking version. When I say, oh, if I tell this person I had Taco Bell, they're going to think that. And I don't want them to think that. So I'm going to tell them this so that they think that about me. I have no control over how that person responds to one thing or the other. I'm totally playing even, it's like another level of the, of the delusion where I'm like, ah, oh, and I'm going to manipulate this situation perfectly where they don't really know who I am and they fully think I'm this salad eating person. It's no, you, <laughs> you're lost. Or that's what I was saying to myself when all of this kind of came to me where I was like, wow, there's so much confusion and delusion and everything in being deceptive. And check it out. <laughs> there I am. And I've told this, this little white lie, right? Where I've, you know, told them this, but it was really this and all of that, right? And the idea here is, is like, I, what, I'm, what I want you to, to think about is how fear can now just come right in. Because now it's like, oh, what if they find out I really had Taco Bell? Or what if they found out I lied about having, oh my. And so there's all this fear now that can be arising because I didn't <laughs> stick to my vow of my moral discipline. Whereas, what'd you have for lunch? Taco Bell. <laughs> Pure honesty. Is what I, you know, and again, this hasn't happened for a while, but the idea is if it were pure honesty like that, where would there be room for fear? You know, just in that one little example, right? But the idea is, is we want to look at this, you know, one little example at a time, because that's how our lives happen, right? <laughs> one little moment at a time in that way. Okay. Everybody, no, uh, no, by the way, that was a good, that was a long answer, a good long answer to your, yeah? Okay, let's look at, unless there's any more questions. Yep. Oh, nice. Hi. Um, so I was just wondering, as you were talking about all these different types of fearlessness, could you also say that there's just a confidence? Like if someone is confident that, you know, they can go into the city or go to the monastery or whatever. I, but anyway, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on that alternate take. Excellent. Perfect is exactly what I wanted to get across tonight is that this fearlessness is not some sort of like, whoa, like it's actually the 
it's about being confident, certain, clear in that way. And I'll use this as an opportunity too, to mention this. One of the hindrances, as they're called, these uh, nivaranas, one of a hindrance in Buddhism is doubt. You might have heard about this. And I like to mention this because when often when people hear doubt, there's certain either religious or Christian or whatever connotations that that can have. And in Buddhism, doubt, doubt is not the opposite of faith. And what I mean by that is, is that doubt, doubt the opposite of doubt is, as uh, Mary, I think that was your name. I'm not sure. I forgot. Apologies. But the opposite of Zara, the opposite of doubt is certainty. And it's such a powerful place, certainty. And again, for me, it's about clarity. And I often, I often kind of use an analogy of cooking or baking something. And you can imagine doing that activity, cooking or baking. You can imagine doing it in a state that's full of doubt, where you're doubting your own ability, you're doubting everything, it, down to like, oh no, did I, did I use salt? It, wait, it, you know, you, and then you put it in the oven and you're checking it every five seconds and it's just full of doubt. Again, doubt about everything. And then even once it's all over, did I leave the oven on? You know, it's just <laughs> doubt upon doubt upon doubt, fear upon fear upon fear. There's another way to do that too. And that's where you, you know how to cook. You've done this a million times. You don't have to check it every five minutes. You'll smell it. You know when it's done. There's a way, and you know, I choose cooking, but we all have a thing that we do well and that we can do with confidence because we're clear about it and we do it. The idea is, is that in that little example of cooking where you can do it full of doubt and uncertainty and it looks this way, or you can do it confidently, fluidly, seamlessly, and it looks that way. <laughs> Again, choose your activity, but I think you know, or I hope you can feel the difference between those two. Well, take that example and extended to one's entire life. <laughs> That's, again, not to set it up as a goal, but where the Eightfold Path ends is this doubtlessness. And again, it's not about faith in Buddha and doubting Buddha. And when you get to the end of this road, you will have no doubt about the Buddha. No, you'll have no doubt about yourself in that way. And nobody call me out on the self word, because you all know what I mean. Okay, let's read a little more. So, regarding, oh, and I mentioned last week that this next one, the next one we're going to talk about is the giving the gift of the Dharma without expecting anything in return. And I mentioned that when, when this phrase first appears, it's a little ambiguous. Is it giving the Dharma or the Dharma of giving? Actually, and I hadn't read further in the Chinese version last week. I'd only read up to where I, we got last week. Reading further, though, it actually makes it clear that it is giving the Dharma, giving the gift of the Dharma. So, Shariputra. Bodhisattvas who give the gift of the Dharma without expectation of material rewards. Uh, it says that they take hold of 10 positive qualities, but if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you'll want to know that 
the word is actually samgraha, which means to kind of harmonize or, or bring together. So take hold of is a little strong when really it's about this harmonizing thing. So a bodhisattva who gives a gift of the garma without expecting material rewards, harmonizes or integrates 10 positive qualities or dharmas. What are the 10? They do not generate a desire or, sorry, I have notes from my reading, but they do not generate negative thoughts, negative desires or negative thoughts. They do not desire others' abundance. They do not desire fame. They are not attached to creature comforts, basically, but household possessions. They are not stingy towards others' households. They are content with the bare necessities of clothing, fooding, bedding, medicine, and other supplies. And what they have said is worthy of being remembered. Oh, sorry, there's more. Gods protect them. It says approach them, but it's actually about gods will protect them. And they do not engage in inappropriate thinking. They direct their minds toward the mind of the Buddha. Shariputra, bodhisattvas who give the gift of the Dharma without expecting material rewards, harmonize these 10 qualities. So let's just kind of go through those. You know, they're kind of, a lot of them are piggybacking off of this idea of not expecting anything in return, right? And so this bodhisattva who gives the gift of the Dharma without anything expected in return. They don't, for example, desire other people's abundance. Makes sense. Oh, and by the way, too, just, just in case something got lost, these are not um, commandments. These are not thou, the bodhisattva shall not uh, desire others abundance. This is just a, this is just a categorical statement that a bodhisattva who gives the gift of the Dharma without expecting anything in reward, just automatically already doesn't desire other people's abundance. They don't desire fame all of that, right? So the one thing, because I wanted to stick to the theme tonight, I, want, I really wanted to stick to this theme of fearlessness. And we've already heard from the previous one that even giving the gift of the Dharma is an aspect of this practice, right? It's part of doing it fearlessly in that way, right? But what I really wanted to focus on, and I'm only going to focus on one because it would be nice actually to get through the other section. And yeah, I just want to focus on one idea. So the idea is about the bodhisattva does not or isn't attached to household things. The way they've translated the Tibetan is that they literally don't possess households. The Chinese is a little more specific that it's specifically about desiring household things. So I just want to point that out. But it's a pretty simple teaching that I want to give about fearlessness and, and using this as an example. But I think it's worth saying, as, as, as simple as this is and kind of as obvious as it is, it's about, uh, as usual, I want to kind of just create two examples, right? One example is someone who is attached to the household things. And, you know, just to make this example more clear, what I'm talking about is, is that it's this thing about when I start to accumulate my stuff. 
that I'm attached to. And I start to get a certain amount of this stuff. And you know what happens? I start to get fearful somebody's going to take it. And so I put locks on all my doors. And then I go get more stuff. And now I'm like getting some really nice stuff. And now I'm even more nervous and fearful that people are going to take my stuff. So I build a big wall around my house that's all locked up with me and my stuff. And this process keeps going in hyperbolic fashion until the person has imprisoned themselves with all of their stuff. And they're sitting in there afraid. Then there's this example of not being attached to household things. And my, the very, very simple point that I'm trying to make is, and it's said a lot, but it's this idea that if you're not attached to anything, you have no fear of losing anything. It, again, it's one of those perfect karmic equations. The more attached to the stuff, the more the fear goes up about losing it. The less attached, why would you be afraid of anybody taking this anymore? So just notice that there's a karmic relationship between those two, and it continues into the next one. And what I mean is, is this. Yeah, I let, yeah, let me just get to the next one. Yeah, and that way we'll be sure to finish all of these up. But what I was going to get at is, and yeah, what I was going to get at is, you can have all the stuff, and then you're attached to the stuff, and then you get this fear meter rising, right? Well, in order to segue to the next one, which is about being joyful alone or, or enjoying solitude, there's one major thing that we're attached to that makes the fear meter go off the charts. <laughs> And that thing that we're attached to, of course, is the self. Because if I'm attached to my stuff and then I'm afraid of people taking it, my fear meter goes up with that attachment. Well, if I'm attached to this body, if I'm attached to this idea of the self in that way, well, then again, there's that karmic relationship between fear and attachment to self. And yes, this is what, I, what I'm talking about is the fear of dying. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. That's the fear. That's like the fear of which all the other fears are kind of pale comparisons of that one. But what I want you to get at again from a kind of insight, Vipassana point of view is noticing how Noticing how there is a very similar emotional relationship between when I'm attached to stuff and then fear that I'm going to lose it and then being attached to self or body and then fear I'm going to lose it. But here's the reason why I wanted to spend one whole night on this idea of anatta, of no self. So the idea here is, is we're, ah, it's so simple. <laughs> the reason why I spent that whole night on this idea of no self is to point at so, I wanted to just point so clearly at how, what the Buddha is talking about is that this notion of a self we have is a fiction. 
that it, and and go you know review that class if you have any doubts about the fictional nature of the self but what i'm getting at is is that if the fear the fear is being caused by this attachment to self and there is no self what does the karmic equation tell us now? For me, it tells me that the, the real understanding of this teaching of no self leads to fearlessness. And what I'm always saying is, I'm always saying this, if there was a self and the Buddha was telling us not to be attached to it, like bad, bad human, don't get attached to self. Yes, there's a self, but don't get attached to it. If that were the case, Buddhism would be one thing, and it would be a form of repression, a form of self-control in that way, where it's like, oh, I want to attach to the self, but Buddha told me not to. <laughs> it's actually about how there's just, we're confused. There is no self in that way. And so that idea of the fear, if the fear is about losing myself when I die, it's the big loss, right? It's like, man, not only am I going to lose all my stuff, I'm going to lose me too. It's the greatest sense of loss. I mean, that we imagine, right? So on that note, just a reminder about the teaching of no self, let's take a look at the last of the qualities, which was that one about um, enjoying living in solitude. So Shariputra, Bodhisattvas who delight in living in solitude. Uh, also, they harmonize or integrate 10 beneficial qualities. What are these 10 that you get from enjoying living in solitude? Well, the Bodhisattva discards busyness. They rely upon disengagement. They focus their minds on samadhi concentration. They don't engage in many activities. They desire to see the Buddhas. Their bodies are never uncomfortable. No obstacles challenge their moral discipline. They attain dhyana, meditative absorption, with very little difficulty. They do not forget the words and syllables of things that they are taught, and they understand the meaning of the teachings that they hear. Shariputra, bodhisattvas who delight in living in solitude, will harmonize those 10 things. Okay, so on those, so those are some, you know, Perks, those are some perks to enjoying living in solitude, right? Body's not uncomfortable. That sounds pretty good to me. Um, getting to see the Buddhas, all of that. So in general, I don't have anything specific to say about those 10. They all kind of, at least for me, kind of line up with that idea of forest dwelling, right? Like discarding busyness. Yeah, I would hope that you're not bringing all of your work and your laptop out to your forest dwelling, right? That's sort of so discarding busyness, um, able to focus their minds, able to concentrate, right? It makes sense if you just kind of think about it, right? But in terms of fearlessness, I wanted to kind of bring it back to the theme tonight and just say a few words about fearlessness as it pertains to living in solitude. So there's a lot to that idea. 
And I just want to remind everybody too, from last week, I kind of broke down this idea, the idea of this particular quality, this enjoying or delighting living in solitude. I mentioned last week that it's about Aranyacharya, the forest dwelling practice. And it has a lot, a few different connotations to it. One is literally going to the woods, but it's primarily about solitude. And I think one of the things that's important to clarify about this solitude, it's you keep in mind that whether it is, um, well, whether it's a monk like Subhuti that I talked about last week, who was famous for forest dwelling practice, whether it's someone like that, or whether it's a bodhisattva, the, whether, no matter who it is in the, this context, this person is sort of understood to be, well, without attachment to that sense of self that we were just talking about. So when they're enjoying solitude, the first thing I want to mention is, is that the idea is, is it's not that they're alone. <laughs> it has to do with that subtle idea of that there isn't no self. So it's not about being all by myself, exactly. And this is actually why I read the section I did last week from the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra that talks about Aranyacharya. It's not, at least in the Vajra Sutra, it's not exactly about the woods, nor is it about solitude. It's actually about this state of being without a self in that way. And if you remember, this was from last week where the Buddha was basically like, so, so what do you think? Can an enlightened person claim that they're enlightened? Like, as soon as somebody says, I'm enlightened, <laughs> from the Buddhist point of view, uh, yeah, good one, is basically the idea, because it negates itself in that sense. And so to avoid that problem, because basically the Buddha was like, hey, Su Su hey, Subhuti, are you enlightened? And he's like, well, the Buddha says I'm enlightened. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna say anything about that, but the Buddha says I'm the one that enjoys Aranya practice. And since there's really nothing to practice and no Subhuti to practice it, that's why he's called Subhuti the one that enjoys Aranya practice. So that state of knowing there's no one and nothing to practice, that is kind of the solitude that we're talking about or the enjoyment of that. Regardless, really what, really what I wanted to mention about fearlessness though, was literally going back to my, where I started this talk, that original sutta the, on fear and dread, it was about the Buddha going into the woods alone. And he was talking about how these other ascetics and Brahmins, when they go into the woods alone, they get all scared. They get all full of fear and dread. He says, but when I, the Buddha, go in the woods alone, I don't get fearful or dreadful, right? So I just want to point out that, again, in the same way I've been doing all night, in terms of insight or vipassana. I, I, again, I want to look at that karmic uh, um, scale. And it's sort of about, well, fear of going out in the woods alone. Like, literally. So no, no more uh, uh, Dharma tricks. I'm not talking about Subhuti. I'm actually talking about literally going into the woods alone and being afraid of doing that or not being afraid of doing that. So fearlessness, just the idea of 
wanting to go <laughs> into the woods alone is sort of this act of fearlessness. I guess what I'm getting at though, is that if out there in the audience, if anyone is fearful of going into say the woods alone, the insight, the, the, the Vipassana work would be to start to look at why. Why would you be afraid to go out into the woods alone? Well, again, obviously you'd probably be afraid of dying. <laughs> That's probably the number one reason for doing that, right? So I've already said a few words about that idea, the fear, the fear of dying. The one thing that I'll kind of say to start to kind of bring this to a conclusion, regarding the fear, the fear, meaning death. I want to remind you that in the Buddhist tradition, death has a name, and it's called Mara. So Mara is this, you know, the evil one, but the word Mara means death. And it's interesting that in the Buddhist mythology or tradition, the enemy the evil one, whom a Buddha defeats in order to become a Buddha. The enemy is death. What I'm getting at is, is this. If you're afraid to go in the woods alone because you're afraid of dying, or if you're just afraid of dying, so was the Buddha until he became the Buddha. That's what the whole story of enlightenment is kind of about. Now, of course, it's about overcoming desire, anger, and fear in that way. It's about overcoming a lot of these things. But what I wanted to get at tonight, and I'm glad this, I'm glad I was able to do this, it's very helpful to know that there is this story about how the Buddha defeated Mara under the Bodhi tree. And what I mean is, is that, you know, you've heard the story, Mara strung a bow with a thousand arrows and shot them all at, at Siddhartha. And that was death coming. And you know what the Buddha did? He performed the Abhaya Mudra, the Mudra of Fearlessness. So this is the Mudra of Fearlessness. And when he performed this Mudra, the, the arrows turned to flowers and rained over his body. There's more to the story, of course, but my point is, is that Mara, death, challenges us. That is the story of the Buddha. Death challenges us and will continue to do so. But the story of the Buddha becoming enlightened under the Bodhi tree, although, again, there's a lot to that, tonight I want to point at how if you just boil it all down, Buddha defeats death. That's what happened. He defeats Mara under the Bodhi tree. And so, again, if you're like me and afraid of dying, that's understood. That's very, very well understood. And again, until our enlightenment, we will be so in that way. But what I'm getting at tonight is, is that, that it is a defining characteristic, a defining quality of enlightenment is this fearlessness. And so I'm trying to draw these relationships to the whole practice from moral discipline to the wisdom of no self, 
all of these things and trying to point at, if anything, what I want to point at tonight is, is how realizable this is, this fearlessness. And I say that, not, again, not from personal experience of being totally fearless, but it's about it's about understanding what I've been saying all night. It's about understanding where the fear's coming from. And if you understand that, that's definitely half of the battle is locating from whence there, this is coming. But what I'm getting at again is just that the practice is about defeating Mara in the long run. And that, While you could do that through lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes of reconditioning or deconditioning, rehabituation, habituating certain things out of you, the Bodhisattva path and the Mahayana and what I'm up here doing every Sunday night is about how the, the wisdom can do it. And when I say do it, I mean the same as the lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes of practice, the wisdom can do it. And tonight, the formula that I tried to put together is the one about fear, our fears are ultimately arising due to and from this sense of self. And if that self is just not real, it's just a fiction then fearlessness is, it's right there, if that makes sense. And again, I'm not saying I've got it, but it's about understanding how this is operating, how this is working, where, again, where the fear is coming from. So, all right, any questions, comments, answers before I go? Everybody feeling okay about all of that? All right. Well, I appreciate you, uh, as always, being here, being present, listening. Oh, it's so good to see everybody. It's so great to see the space full. Oh. All right.